Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Lord to Jesus Christ. The Gospel reading today was very short. And I say be careful of those short ones. They're not as simple as you might think they are. It's a very easy lesson. Don't be greedy. And you can't take it with you. Good enough. But wait, there's more. What possibly could God need from us? What could he lack that we could possibly supply? Go ahead, try and try and come up with something. I, I challenge you. What does God lack that we can supply? Love. Oh, somebody really got Our it. Our love. Thanks. She's a she's on point today. <laughs> That's right. The artificer of the cosmos. The creator of the universe. The archetype of love itself, of existence, requires something of us that he doesn't have on his own. You see, richness towards God doesn't necessarily mean your finances. Here's my 14 seconds of don't forget to give your tithe. There you go, I said it. <laughs> Moving on. Richness towards God is a strange concept. What does he need? You can almost beat yourself over the head. About what, what could it, God doesn't need anything from me. I need God. I need all the God. I need it. I need it and I need it now. God doesn't need anything from me. But I've told you this before, I've told you this for years. The one thing that the Lord doesn't have that we can supply is our love for Him. He cannot manufacture it. We would be puppets. And He wouldn't be a very good God, would He? He cannot command you to love Him. He cannot arrange for you to love Him if you do not. And the one context in which we are equal to God is in relationship. Because what is true relationship? It is a true love, true humility, true relationship is making oneself entirely vulnerable to the other and offering oneself freely. That's relationship. Christ offers himself to us. And if you read the scriptures from the beginning to the end, I'll, I, don't, I always say there's no real end to the scriptures, but uh, because it's alive. But if you take the book and read it from the front cover to the back, <clears throat> you will see a story where God has made himself vulnerable to us, to mankind. He introduces himself tells us about himself, goes to great lengths to offer himself, and you have mankind's response to that. It's like, nah, never mind, I don't like you. Almost repeatedly. Nah, no thanks. It only takes about two weeks, if you're being lazy about it, to walk from Egypt to Israel. What the heck were they doing for 40 years in the desert? Even if it's me lollygagging. Even if you're taking six months to a year to get all your old people and, and, and your youngins to the Holy Land. What the heck took 40 years? You see, in that time, the Lord is still teaching them about himself and revealing himself to them. And they're always stepping in it. And not meeting him in that relationship. And he completely forgives them. They worship other gods. They make golden calves in the desert. And he forgives them and gives them the promised land. Interestingly, 
the land of Israel was only a nation uh, su such as we would understand it uh, for about 100 years, 150 maybe, before it was subjugated again. It wasn't a very <coughs> successful uh, endeavor. It still existed in some way or another, but it, 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 it wasn't a strong player in the, in, in the world. The Lord gave them the promised land and he fulfilled his promise to them and delivered them. And they still rejected him over and over. In exile, they missed him and realized the error of their ways and they called him and he brought them back to himself. <clears throat> Richness towards God. My goodness, all we're doing in the record of this interaction of the Holy Spirit with mankind, with the Christ with mankind... It's constantly saying no. Constantly saying, never mind. I want to do this on my own. Never mind, I don't want you. And he comes back again and again and again until he himself comes in the incarnate word of Christ. He himself comes and reveals himself completely as Trinity, as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at Theophany when Christ is baptized in the Jordan. This is the full revelation of God to mankind. He's offering himself. He offers himself, and then they still killed him. Had to happen. He was giving us this pure example of richness. A full and complete offering. A whole offering, a holocaust. A whole offering to God. He gives his whole offering to men. And it asks us for nothing in, re in return. But that we reciprocate <coughs> that love. He knows, by the way, that we're really bad at it. Clearly, the re let the record show. We're not really good at it. Read the scriptures, and it shows we're not very good at it. <coughs> we're not really good at reciprocating that love that God has for us. That's okay. He recognizes our fallenness and our brokenness and our inability to hold up our end of the bargain. You see, he makes covenants with man, knowing that he's the only one who can fulfill it. He's okay with that. He understands that. He only asks for your entire life. He only asks for your soul, your love in return. It seems to me... And that's a pretty good deal. It seems to me that's a pretty fair arrangement to make. Look what I have done for you. Look how much I have shown to you that I love you. Look at how often I have returned to you when you have turned away. Don't you understand that I love you? I just want you to love me back. <clears throat> Where do we participate in that story, that continuous story of mankind? Are we the ones that turn away? Are we the ones who are not rich towards God? He doesn't need anything from us. The story in the parable is a man who, Christ says, it's a fellow who was a rich landowner and he had a really good bumper crop that year and so much that uh, he didn't have anywhere to store it. All of his barns were full and his silos or whatever. And he says, well, I have the money to do it, why don't I pull them all down and build bigger ones, and then, then I'll be set. And I can tell my soul to take its ease. And Christ says, and God says to him, you're a fool. Tonight your soul will be asked of you. Whose will all this stuff be? And he says to them, so will be for those who are not rich towards God. Nothing here will last. Everything falls apart. <clears throat> Homes crumble over time. You see beautiful buildings in ancient Greece that were clearly gorgeous, and they're in ruins. You see old, beautiful churches uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Great Britain and other places, beautiful basilicas in, in Asia Minor that they're finding underneath the dirt with these incredibly ornate mosaics. And even those churches have not stood the test of time. They're made out of matter. The culture has moved to a different part of the world. These churches were either pulled down or 
or raised or whatever, their use <coughs> has, has, they, they have exceeded their usefulness, and they stand as, as, as memories. Everything falls apart. Everything falls away. At the end of the day, what matters? We can't take any of it with us. Have we been rich towards God? What are we valuing? Do we wake up in the morning and greet the Lord like we would greet a lover? Like we'd roll over and say good morning to our wife or our husband? <clears throat> Do we greet the Lord as we would greet the first person we see in the morning? Good morning. Do we make a prostration? Do we say, good morning, I love you, i got to run. Be with me today. Walk with me today, Lord. If we're not doing that, we should start. It's not, I'm not wagging a finger. How rich are we towards God? Is He the first thing we think about in the morning and the last thing we think about as we're going to sleep? <laughs> Lord, protect me while I sleep. Lord, have mercy on me and all of my dealings with others. Lord, give me the strength to go about my day walking in righteousness, remembering your glory and your gift and your love. Or is that the last thing that we think about? Oh yeah, God, I remember him. Good night. It's a good question to ask. I ask myself before I ask anybody. It's something that we really need to think about. How rich are we towards God? When we have something that he wants. He's been abundantly good to us. <clears throat> are we holding something back from him? that rightfully belongs to him? Because if we are, knock it off. Stop it. The Lord wants something from you. Would we deprive the Lord of what he wants and what he needs and deserves from us? Richness towards God is our love. How do we love God? By loving our neighbor. I think we went over this last week. <laughs> the Good Samaritan, the parable. Love for God is loving our neighbor, which is the greatest of the commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and your neighbor as yourself. It's the same commandment. The other one is like it, which means it's just like it. Love your neighbor, and this is how you're loving God. Do not withhold from God what is his. We love Christ by loving each other. Remember that. Richness towards God is easy <clears throat> when you really think about it. I just ask you to think about it. Think about it a lot. Are we being rich towards God? <clears throat> Perhaps some days better than others. I can say especially for myself. Some days are better than others when I'm being rich towards God. But I can tell you there are plenty of days where I keep it to myself. I hold it back. And I've got something that he wants, and I don't give it to him. Shame on me. May the Lord expose these things in me that I, every day, every part of my day, will go about remembering God's love and honoring that love in the face of everybody I see. Richness towards God is something that we should be thinking about at all times. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory. Glory.